Hello, everyone, and welcome to our AWEA Virtual Boot Camp, Part 1, An Introduction to AWEA. I'm Sean Taylor. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to welcome and encourage you to engage with our expert today by using the Q&A box located in the right corner of your GoToWebinar interface. We will try to answer as many questions as possible during the last 15 to 20 minutes. Please note that all phone lines will be muted during this webinar. After the webinar, we will send an email with a link to watch the webinar on demand. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, David Totman, Director of Asset Management at Innovize. David provides strategic direction for infrastructure systems management across the entire Innovize product line. David has been in the water industry for over 38 years and has applied geospatial technology to business process optimization, project analytics, and full lifecycle infrastructure management for the last 32 years. Prior to Innovize, David was the global water industry manager for Esri and served as the asset manager for Colorado Springs Utilities, one of the largest municipally owned for service utilities in the USA. His state government service included water quality and water rights adjudications. He is a member of the American Water Works Association and the American Society of Civil Engineers. As an officer in the American Society of Civil Engineers, he holds the title of past president of the Utility Engineering and Surveying Institute. David, I will hand it off to you now. Okay, uh, thanks, Sean. So one of the first things we have to make clear here is this is uh, American Water Infrastructure Act virtual boot camp schedule. Uh, it is a five part series, right? So we're doing an entire uh, curriculum, if you will, on, on how technology and as you got the invitation, how the uh, Esri CityWorks and Innovize technology stack helps you uh, provide the information to be AWEA compliant. And so uh, again, this, this five part series, and one of the things I want to kind of uh, emphasize, so part one, we're, we're going into you know, the introduction of the American Water Infrastructure Act. Uh, part two is going to really focus on Innovize and Esri uh, building a GIS-centric water asset registry and kind of the hydraulic components to that. Uh, part three uh, is uh, you know, beyond addresses, right? You attach everything to, to the asset in, in enterprise asset management. So we're going to be talking with CityWorks about using a GIS-centric enterprise asset management system. Uh, part four really is about the asset performance and risk modeling, which is uh, one of the specialties of, of Innovize. And then really uh, part five is where we bring it all together, all, all three systems, Esri, CityWorks, and Innovize coming together um, and helping you uh, do your emergency response plan. Uh, now, one thing I want to emphasize is the fact that uh, think of today as this is the introduction, this is kind of the prequel. Our next webinar isn't until January 15th of 2020, and you'll see that the rest of the uh, OEA boot camp is all in 2020. Uh, and we did this very specifically, uh, very you know, for a specific reason in that. Um, one, we know we're kind of uh, going into the holidays and we want to uh, actually use this webinar as a kickoff and, and get some information. Uh, you're gonna be um, uh, hopefully uh, submitting questions. Uh, we have some polling questions and that really helps get, uh, allow us to collect data that's gonna be really helpful in completing the rest of the boot camp schedule. So again, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going live today on October 23rd and the next webinar is January 15th. Um, kind of a, another reason, um, if you're following uh, the CityWorks uh, uh, information there, um, they've re recently been acquired um, by Trimble, which is uh, exciting news because it allows them to really kind of expand their infrastructure support. But uh, one of the main reasons is um, they're all busy preparing for uh, their CityWorks conference, uh, which is that first week of December. Uh, and so Esri will be there. Of course, CityWorks will be there as well as Innovize. So we're all going to be there uh, talking about how our technology integrates with one another. And, and very specifically, you know, if you're, if you're able to attend, 
um, we can talk about uh, some of the specific OEA components. But so anyway, um, we just thought best to kind of uh, let, uh, let let us finish off uh, the year and then and then kick off uh, the new year with with the rest of the boot camp with uh, very detailed information and product demos on on how we uh, respond to some of the OEA components. So uh, let's go ahead. Uh, we're here with uh, the introduction of WIA, and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you remember anything about this webinar, it's it's all in this URL here. Um, however, I guess if you look at that, no one's going to remember this. Um, I think you might be able to figure it out, uh, but you know you always mess up on the hyphens, and so you know. Uh, scratch that. Don't do not worry about this particular URL. Uh, do exactly what I do um, when I'm trying to find out more about OEA. Uh, just type in EPA OEA on your favorite search engine, and organically, this will be the first page that pops up. Um, so this is the EPA website, and I encourage you to uh, to go there and take a look if uh, like I have uh, you can spend days and weeks kind of pouring through all the information that is provided um, it, it's pretty detailed and the information is actually um, being updated as we speak just because uh, everyone's trying to respond to a we and what does this mean to us and and the regulations what does this mean so this is an active website and, and it's kind of a, a growing uh, so to speak you know as we speak um, so what I want to do though is kind of start off uh, uh, this this webinar with a start off with a polling question that kind of helps set the tone of of who we have in our audience. So Sean, I'll turn it over to you for our first polling question. Great, thank you, David. So our first polling question brings us to: Have you already filed your AWIA certification? I'll give you 30 seconds to uh, fill out and pick your answer, and then we'll go ahead and read the results. So we have the questions here. Go ahead and pick your response, and then we'll look at the results here in about 25 seconds. And it looks like we have some good responses here. So a majority of you, 40% said no, wish to learn more. Another 30% said I do not know. 28% were not applicable, I am a consultant vendor and wish to learn more. And then finally 2% said yes, have already submitted our AWEA certification. Okay. Uh, great. Well, so apparently this this webinar will be uh, good for everybody. The the two percent. Uh, I'm assuming uh, that you're just curious about how the technologies integrate. Um, so congratulations for uh, submitting already. And um, yeah, that's uh, good information. So uh, thank you, Sean. We'll go ahead and continue. And it keeps putting me back in. All righty. So um, what we want to do here is um, just talk a little bit more about some of the administrative details, um, a quick mention of asset management, and you'll see why that's a bit important. Uh, talk a little bit about Esri, CityWorks, Innovise, and then open up for, for Q&A. So on with the administrative details, right? Um, if you're like me, and uh, I'm sure you all read the Federal Register, uh, it's uh, exciting uh, information uh, and, and of special note, volume 84, number 59, back in, in March of this year, um, they kind of introduced uh, you know, the OEA regulations in the Federal Register, right? So that means it's it's getting real, they're starting to publish this, um, and this really kind of goes through some of the OEA legislation at a very high level, but I, again, turn to kind of the EPA website, and if you uh, go to uh, go to that uh, website that we mentioned earlier, um, basically on October 23rd of 2018, OEA was signed into law, uh, the law basically requires community drinking water systems serving you know more than 3,300 people to develop or update these resilience and risk risk and resilience assessments and 
basically the emergency response plans. Now, I know many of you already have uh, ERPs as kind of a common practice, so this shouldn't be uh, news to you. Um, but this, this kind of this blending of the uh, risk and really resilience assessment uh, and the ERP together um, is, is kind of a, a, a new thing from, from the OEA law. If you go into a bit of the details now, uh, you can read these as, as best I can. Plus the fact that you know we're recording this, you'll have this content, and it is again on on the website. Um, but really, it, it it starts off with this risk and resilience assessment, right? That they want to want you to look at the six uh, six components listed here. Uh, really, uh, number one is understanding the risk to malevolent acts and natural hazards. Um, now then kind of build a resilience plan, if you will, uh, to basically your physical system infrastructure, um, you know, for, uh, against, uh, you know, should any of your components fail or be attacked or be destroyed in natural uh, disaster, what, what would, you know, happen? Uh, what's your response? Uh, Number three, the monitoring practices of the system for the financial infrastructure. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, five to me is a bit unique, uh, but it's really about all the chemicals. And this is our chemicals that you own, uh, like in your treatment plants and various facilities, um, but also chemicals that might be discharged into the environment um, from other sources that are not you. And, and how do you manage that? Um, and that gets us into some of the kind of the source water protection. And then six is a huge topic, just simply the operations and maintenance of your system. They want to make sure that you, you know, have a plan on how you uh, go about your daily uh, O&M activities. Uh, from the ERP re uh, component, it's, it's filed six months after. Uh, and, it, and it needs to incorporate the findings of your risk and resilience assessment because from the resiliency, you're going to have some plans on infrastructure and then they want to make sure the ERP uh, has mitigation procedures to protect uh, that infrastructure. So uh, these four components, the first one, you know, what strategies uh, do you have to improve the resilience? So that's a little bit of pre-planning, almost call that emergency preparedness, right? Uh, number two, the plans and procedures. Uh, you know, should these acts occur, that's almost really the uh, kind of the emergency uh, response component. Uh, three is also a bit of the same thing, but it's almost the kind of the um, uh, planning preparedness of how would you mitigate uh, once you understand some of these threats, how do you kind of harden the system? How do you protect your system components uh, should an event occur? And really then, if, if it, the, the worst case scenario happens, do you have alternate water supplies, right? How would you go about doing some of that? Um, and then number four is almost puts you in this um, kind of observation mode or, or, or emergency kind of recovery of, uh, you know, how should you go into that? What what detection strategies do you have to kind of help, uh, you know, not put you in that that particular uh, condition. So um, again, all these elements, a little bit different take on what uh, the elements of, of an ERP. Before we move on, actually, I do want to turn it over for uh, another polling question, Sean. So about the, about the size of the systems. Great, thank you, David. So this brings us to our second polling question. What size population does your community water system serve? And I'll give everyone 30 seconds here to submit your responses, and then we'll take a look at those. Thank you. Looks like we're getting some really good responses here. So we'll go ahead and close up the polling question and share the results. So what size population does your community water system serve? Looks like 33% were not applicable. I'm a consultant vendor. 26% were at or greater than 100,000. 22% were between a little over 3,000 to 49,000. 19% were 50,000 to 99.9, .9. and then uh, nobody responded for I do not know. David, okay, I will that, hand it back that, to you. 
Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense, right? Um, obviously, the consultants that answered the first question. Uh, and then, uh, uh, but it, it's good to see that, uh, you know, there there are folks kind of spread across the board. We, we in, in kind, of, kind of talking to uh, various customers out there, the, the large organizations are already, you know, trying to respond. They already have many systems in place. Um, it's really the small to mediums that, we find um, are, are, are the most interested in what can technology uh, do for them. So um, yeah, good, good results. Thank you for that. All right, so these certification deadlines, one of the reasons we, we wanted to talk about uh, the, the population size, because there's a, a kind of a, a graded scale of, of response, right? Um, uh, how you respond to these. So the over 100,000 population, uh, the due date's March 31st, and we realize our boot camp has taken us right up until the, the last minute. But again, like I say, most of the, of the big systems are already kind of in, in preparation mode. Uh, obviously our polling question showed that uh, several have already filed, um, but uh, so there are, there are risk and resilience assessments due in March. Uh, their ERP is due uh, in September of 2020. Uh, for those of you in the 50,000 to 100,000 range, basically you have until uh, December of next year. Uh, so it's good we're, we're starting early to kind of prepare for some of that. Then your ERP isn't due until the following summer of 2021. And of course, um, the, the smaller populations, less than 50,000, um, you have all the way until June, summer of 2021, and then your ERP due in uh, you know, December of, of 2021. So again, though uh, these dates will pop up uh, before we know it, so it's good to go ahead and get that early start. And when we kind of look at uh, the number of utilities, these are all, you know, because we is all based on your um, your uh, public water um, system information ID, uh, basically your permit, right? Your 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 community water system permit. Uh, so about 400 of the utilities are replying, are responding by spring of next of next year. Um, the net second range is another 550 or so. And these are approximate numbers. Um, and then the, the bulk, uh, 8,200 of you have to respond again by 2021. So uh, lots of organizations all in the same boat, all having to uh, respond to these deadlines. So there is uh, training. If you have not, uh, again, gone to the website, EPA is offering free training. Uh, they walk you through this PowerPoint presentation that they have. Uh, we're going to go through much of the same content. Um, and these are all listed kind of by the EPA region. Uh, notice uh, two, two sections in the Northeast, just because there's lots of, uh, of the smaller organizations, smaller towns out there. If you kind of rearrange this by dates, um, we still have five training sessions left. Uh, so if you're in the Chicago or Annapolis uh, areas, you know, uh, um, we have training that's right around the corner. And then we kind of finish off uh, going up to uh, Thanksgiving there, finishing off in Atlanta. But again, um, you know, I, I would encourage you to take advantage if you can of these free uh, trainings by the EPA. And if not, uh, stay tuned to our boot camp. We're going to give you much of the same information, actually show you how technology uh, can help you. Um, uh, comply with a lot of the information requests. Some of the EPA resources out there, uh, they have their fact sheet uh, that's uh, very, very, very clean, just a two pager, uh, it jumps right to just the facts. Uh, they do have this primer, um, pretty much contains a lot of the same information, a little bit different uh, lens of, of information on this. Uh, this baseline information on malevolent acts for community water systems, uh, pretty detailed actually goes into discussing what uh, acts that you could uh, be responsible for, um, and then how you kind of go about hardening some of your systems. So again, uh, lots of good information there. Uh, their community water system emergency response plan template is literally is a template. If you were to fill out all the, the components of this particular template, uh, you know you're you're halfway there, right? So. Um, Lots of good information there. And of course, there's this VSAT. They have some online uh, assessment tools, vulnerability assessment tools that you can kind of walk through that also gives you content that you can uh, respond to uh, the requirements. So again, lots of good resources from the EPA. If, uh, you know, this really is what uh, you are 
uh, doing is you're turning in these two certifications. You're turning in your risk and resilience assessment and your ERP. And literally, it's just these forms, right? You're, you're filling out your, your kind of name and, and who you are and your, your permit ID, if you will, uh, and, and signature, okay? So it really just comes down to filling out these two certification forms. Um, from the certification, uh, you know, you do your risk and resilience assessment first, is what we talked about, and then you do your ERP after that. And you must submit it though per public water system identification. And so for many of you, that's easy. Uh, you have the one treatment plant or, or you know, one system ID. Um, you know, I feel sorry for the folks like American Water uh, who have many, many different systems, but as progressive and advanced as American Water is, I know they're well prepared uh, for you know, submitting their certifications. Um, the trick here is you, know, you do not send in the plans themselves. Right, all you're sending in is the certification seats, sheets that says, yes, I've done these plans. Now, uh, once you submit, you know, you need to have those plans ready in case they call you and want to do a review. But again, you're not sending in these documents, you're just signing the certifications and moving forward. Um, right in the law and kind of on the EPA web website, it says you do not have to follow any one standard. Right, they're really kind of keeping this open as to you know use what fits your organization best. Um, there are lots of resources we've mentioned. The EPA, the American Water Works Association has lots of manuals of practice that fit right in. The EPA even recommends that you adhere to some of the manuals um, to help you fill out the documentation. Um, from organizations that I belong to, of course, uh, well, AWA, but also American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, the National Institute of Standards, um, all, all of lots of great resources out there. And and this may sound funny, but if well, those of you that know have listened to my webinars, um, it's you know pretty frank talk here that you know I just want to kind of comment that there is no compliant software systems out there, right? Um, the EPA is not, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of certifying any particular software uh, to date uh, that, I, uh, that I'm aware of here. Um, so if a, if a vendor kind of comes to you and says, oh, we have this, OWEA, you know, guaranteed you buy our software, we have this OWEA compliant software, uh, no such thing exists right now. Um, the reason we did this virtual boot camp, Esri CityWorks and as Innovise coming together is we wanted to show you though, you know, how our, our technology stack uh, integrates and can bring you all the information you do need to then submit for the certification, a little bit different uh, uh, take on that. So uh, mentioning software systems though, right? If we go back to that template, that community water system emergency response plan template, right in there, uh, you know, one of the sections on, on describing your utility, it literally says, uh, you know, if you use an asset management system, you know, basically simply print those out and insert it into the section, right? And it talks about uh, the EPA's asset management website, which can be an entire another, you know, webinar series in its own right. And so they kind of link to other systems. So again, kind of that tie uh, to asset management, right? Um, now, for those of you that have also kind of seen some of my webinars on asset management, having, you know, been a practitioner that used lots of different technologies, um, I will suggest in today's market right now, uh, everyone that does enterprise asset management, it's it's quite a busy uh, market, right? There's lots of folks offering great solutions, um, and we work with many of these, um, but there's a lot of people involved in enterprise asset management, right? Um, but I would suggest that asset management is not a software, right? It, it is a methodology, of course, guided by standards using multiple integrated software systems. And I would propose that these systems include all of the following. Um, we don't have time to walk through all of them, but of course, some of the biggies are, uh, you know, a GIS, a, a work management system, or CMMS or EAM, you know, depending upon, uh, you know, the classification of the system, uh, all the different components, your laboratory information system, your SCADA systems, of course, all the inspections that you're doing, um, you know, now, uh, granted, this is all about water, so some of the newer technologies, the acoustics, acoustic monitoring that you have, some of the flux technologies that are out there that help you with condition assessments, but also very important, 
and and the very nature of what Innovize does is you having a capacity and risk models, right? Um, capacity management goes hand in hand. as should be part of your asset management program because um, you know assets can fail due to structural defects, but they can always fail just simply due to capacity. Um, and one thing you're always doing is you're upsizing, downsizing certain components. So that you really have to have those hydraulic models in place to understand how to do those effectively. So all these different systems come into play um, when we're doing asset management. And many of them help you with these OWEA compliance. So again, kind of going back to this, this market uh, diagram of all the different players, what we're really here today in this, uh, talking about this, the OWEA virtual boot camp. it's really how really, you know, the Esri, CityWorks, and Advice stack uh, all come together, and we're all talking to the Esri Geo database, right? That single system of record that's feeding the entire uh, data set, right, a single source of truth uh, that we all work against that provides the information that would be for your, you know, OWEA compliance. Now, if I were to kind of look at all those requirements that we went through on the risk and resiliency and then the emergency response plan, if I were to put those into one word responses, you know, I, I would walk through number one was all about risk. Uh, to, to these malevolent acts and natural hazards. Two is the resilience, basically the resources you have to be resilient, the monitoring of the system, the financial element is, do you have the funding mechanisms and do you have, you know, billing systems in place that help you manage that, right? Um, is kind of all about number four. The, again, the chemicals, uh, again, kind of interesting to see that pop in. And, and it really is about, you know, your, again, your own chemicals and, and, and storage of chemicals, but also, you know, malevolent acts, say contamination events, um, but also then, you know, release potentials out there in the natural system, right? Um, especially for source water protection and what, what could be happening out there. And six, you know, that, that big O&M bucket really is talking about, you know, what you do every day uh, is, is, you know, you're, you're very much doing the operations maintenance. They just want to know, you know, how you're doing that and do you have a plan on how you're doing that? And then ERP, the strategies, procedures, mitigation, surveillance, a lot of the elements of, of a good ERP. And when I was looking at, you know, when we were developing this boot camp, we were kind of saying, well, all right, so with Esri, you know, where do you fit? And CityWorks, where do you fit? And Innovize, of course, where do you guys fit? And, you know, I, I kind of thought, I, I kind of thought that, well, you know, maybe, maybe Esri fits here and, you know, CityWorks fits over here. This is some of my pre pre-thought before we really got into that, before I spent those days coming through the website and looking at our own technology stacks, um, you know, how that might fit. And this is just, this was just a guess, right? Well, as it turns out, as I started uh, kind of diving deep and we started talking, uh, all of us amongst ourselves with Esri and CityWorks and Innovize, we realized, you know, we, we virtually fill every single requirement with, elements of our technology stack. And that's what this whole boot camp is about, um, especially as we go into 2020. It's a very deep dive into each of the technology stacks and how they fill this this, this chart out, if you will. Um, but we're, uh, again, we're kind of, kind of in the introduction phase. So um, Sean, I'd like to turn it over to you uh, for first of all, our uh, polling question on, do you have a GIS? Thank you, David. So we'll open up the polling questions here. Do you have a GIS? And I'll give you 30 seconds to respond and then we'll close up the polling questions and look at the results. And quite honestly, this is fair game for the consultants of you that are signed on. I'm sure that uh, you're using a GIS or maybe not, we'll see. Getting some good responses here. Looks like a lot of yeses. And we'll go ahead and close the polling. And as we said here, 90% of you said yes, use Esri ArcGIS. Another 5% said yes, use another GIS. 3% did not know, and 2% no, we do not have a GIS. Okay. Well, that's uh, very much uh, uh, to be expected, I think. Okay, here we go. 
So uh, let's jump right into the, the overwhelming response. You already have Esri ArcGIS, so none of this should be new to you per se. Um, but again, we're going to go into a much deeper dive. So you're very already familiar that uh, uh, ArcGIS has three fundamental systems. It starts off with their kind of their system of record, and this is where we talk about the asset registry, right? It's it's what do you have uh, in your system. Their system of insights is all about the analytics, all about the different analytical tools and visualization tools that you have to kind of gain that, in, that insight into the data that you have. Uh, their system of engagement um, with their, their maps and apps, you know, how do you get that information like out into the field and even into the hands of your customers, right? Um, very important when it comes into the, the ERP. And this real-time measurement, even when I was at Esri, we were kind of discussing, is that another system? Because we all know we have SCADA systems and things like that, but we really, it, came to the understanding that real-time data now, especially in this day and age with the internet of things, is really pervasive. It, it really you know, feeds all these systems, right? Real-time data is, is very commonplace now to have in your system of record, in your system of insights, in your system of engagement, right? So it really is this underlying theme that just becomes part of uh, your GIS information. And so if we go back to the requirements um, and, and as we move on into the boot camp. You know, the, the system of record has elements of meeting, of course, the risk and resi resilience of number five with the chemicals. You know, where are the where are my facilities, where are the chemicals stored? And then using kind of the GIS on the on the natural side of things, where where might contaminants be um, from other systems, right? How would they flow? How would they get into my system? And, and what do I need to know? And of course, it, you know, it's it's always the GIS is fundamental to your O&M, to your operations maintenance, and really does come into play with the emergency response response plan number one in setting strategies. Um, system of insights, of course, it's about the analytics, understanding where these things might be and, and how am I doing with my O&M. And then, you know, with the system of engagement uh, in your emergency response plan, you know, some of those procedures, it really is also about getting this information during the emergency response out to other organizations like police and fire and public works and all the other different, the electric utility, getting this information out so everyone can kind of respond to, to some of these events. And then real time, of course, is really the, the fundamental nature of the monitoring and surveillance components of, of OEA. What you're also going to see as we start to, you know, in our boot camp is really talk much more about the utility network management extension, right? Um, this, the kind of the, the next generation of utility network modeling, if you will, um, on how they model complex utility networks. It, it really takes us into this next generation, this advanced network modeling capabilities with all the visualization and embedded analytics and, and really this pervasive access, right? How I can kind of uh, run this tool across to, or across the entire platform, but it really starts to get me into, you know, understanding, you know, the mapping elements, but also takes me into these, uh, these schematics. And so if I look at, you know, all the different elements that feed, you know, kind of your entire business workflow that kind of that almost that infrastructure lifecycle management. It, it, GIS has always been about the maps, but it's so much more, especially with the utility network and going into the schematics. It gives you kind of this, this schematic representation of your system. Uh, when I was at the utilities, we'd call this our one line maps, right? And, and it's really can be used even for water systems because it takes almost a, a, a operational view of your system and you can understand kind of what's upstream from uh, say, you know, the the head perspective, or if you're doing pressure zones, how it falls out in kind of a schematic view, very useful in understanding kind of the connectivity and upstream downstream components. Um, and then of course the component views themselves. Uh, one of the things that utility network does is it brings in this high fidelity. Uh, it has this concept of containment that allows me to embed, you know, features within features which we would use all the time in plant and some vertical assets like your pump stations and, and, and everything else out there. And of course it does bring you know, more advanced analytics because we have more intelligence in which we can kind of analyze um, an exciting element for me is kind of this historical and planned views, right? They have a new versioning scheme that allows me to understand the state of my system at any one point in time. That's gonna be very useful as I go into resilience planning 
you know, how should I maybe change my system, right? And I, I create a version of that and actually alter my, my assets to prepare for this resilience plan. What would that look like? And I can store a snapshot of that or a version of that. So again, very kind of exciting capability, especially with OWEA and under building resiliency uh, plans. And then of course, you know, the 3D is just, uh, just way too cool, right? And and actually quite necessary as I go into understanding the kind of the real world and visualizing this in 3D, which helps me, especially with some of my flood inundation, right? What infrastructure is going to be impacted from a visual perspective? It makes it a very, uh, very effective. Then, if, of course, you know, uh, the utility network, uh, really the goal there is to, you know, it's to get it off the desktop, put it into a web browser, put it into mobile, just kind of make sure that, you know, everyone's kind of seeing the same view across the entire enterprise. Um, let's uh, go back to another question or polling question, Sean, about uh, do you have a CMMS or an EAM? Great. And that brings us to our fourth polling question. Do you have a CMS or EAM? So I'll give you 30 seconds to respond and then we'll go ahead and close the polls and look at the results. We have a lot of varying responses here. So once we close up the polls, we'll go ahead and look at the results. Yeah, that might be expected because uh, that, that one screen about all the different asset management systems, there's a lot of them out there. There is, and it looks like 42% of you had said yes, I or we use CityWorks. Another 20%, 23% said no, I or we do not have a CMMS or EAM. 21% said yes, I or we use another CMMS or EAM, and then 14% did not know. Okay, so lots of lots of folks out there uh, using uh, CityWorks, but also um, a lot of folks that don't have anything at all are using uh, something different. So that that's all good. This information will be quite useful, uh, all the same. Great, thanks, Sean. Okay. Well, CityWorks, uh, for those of you, uh, the 42%, I believe, that already have CityWorks, again, you already you already know this information. Um, you know, what is CityWorks, uh, their, their asset management system? Well, you know, kind of all starts with public inquiries, right? I have a water main break. Um, I've got, you know, for other infrastructure, signal malfunctions, potholes, you know, kind of all starts with, you know, something's happened to my system. I mean, when we talk about asset management, uh, for years, uh, you know, Utilities are, are experts at responding uh, to, you know, events. Uh, you know, we're always in this reactive asset management. Um, we just call it doing our job, right? Um, so it starts with some event, um, and we won't aren't going into the whole plan maintenance, all those other components. But you know, when we show up uh, on site to to fix this, you know, there's some investigation, some inspection. You know, it's perfect time to confirm the asset information, diameter, material. Was, was that really cast iron or ductile iron? Um, you know, great time to kind of do that asset verification. Um, you know, you can kind of take a look at any prior work history. That's why we write uh, work to the asset itself and not addresses. Um, and of course, it you know, CityWorks is, does a great job at scheduling and dispatching the crews uh, out you know to these various events. Once you're there, of course, you're going to remediate the event. You're going to take some action. Uh, you're going to go ahead and record all the work that was done, what material was used, what equipment was used. All this, you know, is cost. So you're you're looking at the labor and the material and equipments, all those costs. You know, rolling that up, and then you know they have great analytics that you know help you answer those questions of where, when, how much, and and actually then. Once you start looking at those assets that have uh, particularly failed, you can start to extrapolate to other systems and kind of ask the, you know, where and when could we expect uh, these issues to pop up uh, elsewhere in the system? So that's that's all part of their CityWorks uh, AMS. What a lot of folks may or may not know then is also the PLL side of CityWorks, which really handles all the permitting. And, and many times in the infrastructure lifecycle, those go hand in hand. Um, from the permitting side, we're, we're really talking about 
of course, is you know the the permitting of the various structures, um, how they go into you know the plan review and the permits that are issued. Um, once folks move in, you know this uh, all the different code inspections that it takes to get someone to move in. But again, at my utility, when we had a certificate of occupancy, we knew that those assets that was almost like T equals zero of the assets. Now they start to convey uh, to a customer, right? So that asset is now providing a service, and we're going to make sure that we're providing good service to that customer. So it really is the precursor, if you will, the whole permitting construction side of things is the precursor to your asset management um, when it gets into actually you know assets coming into service. And then just like on their AMS side, they have lots of analytical capabilities to better understand how that whole uh, construction process uh, moves along. And it's a great way to kind of also from a workflow perspective to, to say, you know, the staging of the work that goes into, you know, creating those those assets, if you will. Uh, the one thing you all know then about uh, CityWorks, it is GIS centric. Uh, the one asset inventory, right? That the 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 asset registry in CityWorks is indeed, you know, the asset feature class in ArcGIS Geo database. And I would add to that that uh, Innovice sits on the same you know flow right it's we we all operate off the esri uh geo database and so it very makes it very convenient to 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 have the one system of record also makes you know uh, gives you that single source of of truth CityWorks provides, of course, their their solution across all the different user experiences. Uh, whether you're you're in the office or you're out in the field, either with a ruggedized laptop or on a mobile device, tablet device, and how the real estate changes for those. Um, of course, they provide that user experience across the entire uh, platform of of devices. Now, if I take a look at this, you know. The thing about CityWorks, right? The work order and the map are tied together. They're all virtually inseparable, right? Because they want to make sure you you tie that work order to the asset and you understand kind of the context where that asset sits, um, whether it be in a residential area or it's cross country, you always have your work orders um, tied to the assets in the map. And that becomes very uh, critical, uh, you know, in, in the OIA compliance, especially with the, all the O&M activities, you you can show that you have a planned system of maintenance, and it's tied to your asset registry. Uh, of course, they also have mobile solutions, which allows you to take that uh, out into the field. And that, again, we kind of mentioned in the ERP, it's very tied into ERP number two on having those plans and procedures in place and, and sharing information. Um, their storeroom capabilities, right, to, to manage the materials, to manage those chemicals. Uh, you know, they have the ability to kind of manage all those, almost, if you will, pre-assets or or materials that you use to maintain your assets. Again, a, a kind of a critical component to the ERP. Uh, uh, I shouldn't say ERP, the, the risk and resilience of understanding where those, whether those chemicals are stored. And then last but not least, of course, they have uh, very uh, easy to understand dashboards that bring all of that information together. It helps you with you know, kind of responding to your O&M uh, management of the system. And I think uh, last but not least, Sean, we have our last poll. Thank you, David. So this brings us to our final polling question. We'll go ahead and open up the polls here and give you 30 seconds to respond, and then we'll close the polls and look at the results. And here we are looking at uh, pretty much any, you know, any of the uh, capacity models, hydraulic models that are out there, or any of the uh, risk models that are coming to the market. And it looks like we had some varying responses here as well. So again, do you have any capacity and or asset performance and risk modeling software? And a majority or 38% of you said yes, I or we use Innovise products. 34% said no, I or we do not have any modeling software, 20% did not know, and then 9% said yes, I or we use another modeling software. Okay, great. Well, and, and that that's again, still applicable to our boot camp here. Um, you know, uh, again, it's, uh, you know, um, 
we're presenting all of the requirements of WIA, and there are many elements that you know you can respond without some of the models, but really uh, the models help you better understand, manage the system, and and really prepare for the resilience component and and the risk components in in understanding um, different scenarios. So, uh, being cognizant of the time, I'm going to kind of move up, move along here, so we can definitely get to some of the uh, the, the Q and A. Um, so a bit about Innovise, right? Uh, if you haven't been to uh, innovise.com, I highly uh, recommend it. Uh, we've done complete overhauls of our of our website. Hopefully, uh, the information's easier to get to, easier to understand. Um, if if you don't agree with that, uh, please let us know. We're always looking uh, for ways to improve um, our website and how we communicate uh, with our customers. Want to talk about uh, Innovise with respect to the complete line of ArcGIS based modeling systems. We have InfoWater, and I'll talk a little bit more about our latest product, InfoWater Pro, uh, which, uh, and then our um, Info Sewer. Uh, and our Info Swim. Uh, you can pretty much tell by the names. Uh, info Water is about distribution systems. Sewer is very specific, specific about gravity mains, but Info Swim really opens it up to all gravity systems, uh, which includes, say, you know, surface water uh, as well as, as as gravity mains and sewer. But um, uh, you know, it, it kind of looks at the entire. Uh, uh, gravity-based systems, uh, so like with rainfall events and everything, and how that would come into, uh, say, storm systems and things of that nature. And then, but last but not least, um, Info Asset Planner, and we'll kind of go into that uh, in greater detail. But again, all of these are based on ArcGIS. All of these use the Esri Geo database. So InfoWater Pro, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about our, our, our leading hydraulic model uh, for water distribution networks, but it's now on ArcGIS Pro. You'd be interested to know about that and talk about that. But everyone turns to InfoWater for uh, you know one of the more, more common models, the unidirectional flushing uh, that we have. Um, you can even go into kind of uh, understanding design from a hydraulic standpoint uh, and how that kind of works uh, within my network topology, but of course, the Pro brings in our 3D aspects, and we'll kind of take a look at that um, in in much greater detail within the boot camp. Of course, uh, you know the 64-bit ArcGIS Pro, uh, wow, just just really makes it shine uh, with uh, you know uh, performance, uh, and and really makes you more productive. So you spend you know more time doing modeling and understanding the results than you do panning and zooming uh, across a very complex network. And then it still includes all the kind of the dedicated modeling apps, uh, our demand allocator, criticality assessment, pressure zone manager, and many, many more that are within the system, right? So InfoWater Pro kind of contains the, the same InfoWater tools of like understanding uh, unidirectional flushing. If you have, say, you know, stagnant systems, how you would do your hydrant flushing program, uh, it has uh, kind of uh, containment impoundment. Uh, you can understand where you know, uh, critical valves because of, of if I have to shut down this water main, what are the valves that are very necessary for, you know, uh, minimal water loss during that water main break. Um, of course, we have kind of our <clears throat> demand allocator that helps you understand what's going on in the system. Uh, even, you know, from our pump station perspective, uh, you know, pump performance curves, uh, pump efficiency, uh, as well as then also from the water quality side, right? So we manage both water quantity and water uh, quality components, but really bringing this now into the whole ArcGIS Pro 3D interface, right? The 3D really makes the results come alive um, as we understand the impacts of, of various hydraulic conditions on our system. Uh, <clears throat> with respect to InfoWater Pro, it really kind of tackles, and I'm not, not going to go through every one of these. Again, we have more in-depth uh, uh, webinars uh, in the boot camp, but from uh, responding to the, the six components of the risk and resilience and the four of the emergency response plan, really info water, it, it, it really is all about the hydraulic performance, right? You can understand, say, contaminant spread within your pipes uh, through you know dissolution. Uh, you can model, let's say, removal of certain components like what happens with the you know certain water main break um, or even like say if you removed if a pump station was taken out 
due to one of these malevolent acts? What would be the impacts uh, to the system and my customer base uh, should I lose a pump station? Um, the financial element, you'd be like, ah, hydraulic model has nothing to do with financials, but actually it does, right? Because w when you're constantly repairing your system, you should be doing uh, capacity management and you may be doing capacity upsizing. Um, especially now that things are kind of uh, back in gear, you may be preparing for a new subdivision. There's always upsizing requirements. Well, obviously those have a funding comp uh, uh, impact. Um, so yeah, uh, hydraulic models do affect uh, the financials. Um, again, the chemicals, we kind of talked about uh, modeling things, but it's something as simple as like aged water, right? Um, when you have stagnant water in the system, uh, people who get, you know, you get complaints, uh, calls on, on bad tasting water. Well, it's probably, you know, disinfection byproducts, you know, from chlorine reduction. So these are the things that you can kind of model in the system. And then of course, you know, O&M, it helps you kind of with that unidirectional flushing. What does your hydrant flushing program look like? All those sorts of things. Um, from the ERP perspective, again, it's, you know, what components maybe you want to look at for hardening of the system if, if it was you know, taken out by, let's say, one of these malevolent acts. And you can always build kind of these scenarios for like hydraulic redundancy, right? Should I lose part of the system? What, what would I need to do to prepare for that. Um, when we take a look at, well, InfoWater Pro uh, 2.0, which I'm very excited about, this actually supports uh, the utility network. Um, uh, when we first got into Pro, that was kind of one of the first questions is, oh, you're using the utility network. Well, version 2.0 uh, will be supporting the utility network. Uh, so yes, it will be able to read and write to the uh, Water Distribution Utility Network Foundation. So that's uh, very exciting news for us. Uh, Info Sewer, um, you're like, why, did, why are you talking about sewer, Dave? This is a water thing. Well, really, it, it does kind of help you understand some of the hydraulics and, and what we call surcharging conditions, the D over D ratios. And when we're talking about understanding some of the contaminant elements, right? Um, and you want to look at the whole system. You know, I, I kind of need to know that for say overflows. Uh, if the system discharges, of course, that's kind of a release of contaminants into the, your environment. And if you're doing source water protection, you kind of need to know some of these things. For those then of you that kind of do both water and wastewater, uh, something to think about uh, modeling on both sides. Um, not really going to go, again, this is sewer other than yes, you know, um, understanding search charge uh, uh, conditions could help you understand, say, that that risk. Uh, it's almost a risk against yourself if you have a discharge condition, but again, helps us with understanding um, potential contaminants uh, that might be released into the field. Uh, InfoSwim is probably a lot more um, uh, relevant. Um, really, this takes us into, again, kind of that uh, whole urban drainage modeling. The I have a rainfall event. What is that going to look like for, say, flood inundation? But it also helps me with kind of doing design and understanding my culverts and, and my and my own sanitary sewer system. Is it going to be handle the runoff? And what would that kind of take a look at uh, for some of the risks against my water system? And, and again, not really you know, as applicable, but it does. It, again, from kind of modeling um, the natural systems, uh, overflow events due to rainfall, uh, even say like non-point source contamination that's driven by flow, uh, really kind of gets me into the whole source water protection discussion. Uh, now Info Asset Planner, something near and dear to my heart, uh, one of the things I'm responsible for. Um, it really, in the beginning, everyone thought about as a capital planning tool, but it really is this complete asset performance and risk modeling package, right, for both the capital planning and risk-based tactical O&M decisions. Uh, customers are using our tools more and more for kind of that real-time asset management decision-making within O&M. Um, so it is an environment that kind of brings all of your information together, uh, really helps you kind of compile and understand your inspection data, completely integrates with your CMMS. So uh, if your city works, uh, yes, we, we dial in and we've upgraded all our APIs to connect to the latest and greatest city works. So you're able to seamlessly bring in your city works data uh, into our performance risk modeling tools. Um, it basically in the end, you know, you're, you're uh, doing risk modeling and it really helps you with some of these resilience scenarios, understanding how do I reduce my total risk? How do I understand the highest risk uh, elements, uh, you know, within within that model um, that really kind of takes me into, you know, again, kind of understanding that total risk, but it helps you kind of meet your targets and, uh, and of course, I say, support the capital planning. But 
it really the tools get us into these asset management plans uh, is has been part of the discussion because of the tools used globally um, that's very popular across the globe but these asset management plans really are becoming then your risk and resilience assessment plans right so it's all kind of uh, one in the same a lot definitely a lot of the same information uh, Info Asset Planner, uh, really, you know, then it, it, as it models total risk, um, it, it has an effect on many of these different systems. From the financial part, our, our lifecycle cost analysis tools really, of course, impact the budget, understanding kind of the optimizing your OPEX, CAPEX span, when to, to do uh, asset rehabilitation, uh, kind of the, the when the when piece to uh, to asset management. And of course, it allows you to build the scenarios and, and understand some of these uh, resiliency plans that you're putting into effect as I make changes to my system. You know, does that indeed uh, reduce overall risk? One of the things about, you know, uh, Info Asset Planner, our, our last August release uh, that we just had uh, allows us to do the multi-parameter cost tables for, for the consultants out there. They are doing these very advanced cost tables of, you know, diameter size, depth of berry, soil type, um, very convenient tool now to put those costs into one table and have it then uh, populated into our risk model. Uh, the advent of the third party inspection importer uh, now allows us to bring in inspection data for water systems uh, that allows you to do the condition assessment. And then coming soon, uh, Info Asset Planner 2020.1, which will be our next major uh, release, we're introducing project prioritization. Asset prioritization has been very uh, successful with customers, but every single customer asks about, well, can you lump these into projects, right? Can you build projects for us? So you really can, or will be able to set some cost parameters uh, and then cluster these assets um, based on you know, diameter and material, of course, but really rehabilitation method, right? Because if you're doing pipe bursting, you wanna make sure those assets are indeed connected. But if you're just doing open trench, um, they just have to be within the right of way or easement. So again, a very useful tool to be coming out. And then the, the million dollar question everyone asks, you know, when will it be on pro just like InfoWater? And that's definitely scheduled for the uh, calendar year 2020. Uh, so really our approach uh, to, uh, you know, all of this, um, we really need a hydraulically competent asset registry, right? Um, and that goes with the Esri kind of Innovise Bootcamp webinar. Um, the need to model both the natural and built systems, you need to model quantity and quality, uh, performance and risk, and of course the financial elements. And that work order data is critical to calibrating these models right because work orders are reality work orders are real that was water main break is a date time stamp with uh, you know with the city works information that is gathered is critical because that's what's real and i can calibrate my models with that um, of course monitoring is best achieved with real-time operational analytics understanding you know um, that information that's coming in and and really for us you know resilience is an exercise in scenario building Right, it's it's just modeling. It, it always has been, um, but resilience is kind of the the new term on the market uh, that talks about how we do these scenarios. So, for further information, uh, this is right out of the Federal Registry. It's right off the EPA uh, website. You can contact Newshot Dyson for for any and all questions. Um, the person responsible really for the OEA implementation. There's the email address. But again, if you uh, have any questions, feel free to contact myself, uh, uh, david.totman at innovice.com. More than happy to answer the questions. And I think we have a couple of minutes, um, but again, this will be recorded. We'll, have, we'll indeed answer all of the questions, and this really helps us feed the rest of our boot camp. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, some of the questions. Um, not too many out there. Uh, if any of you have questions, make sure you type into the dialog box there on questions. Um, let's see. Let's say we just have a couple of minutes. I'm surprised, but um, so if you're wondering a little bit about the boot camp, um, we're going to go into great detail. This was really about kind of a prequel about talking about OEA, talking about how our technology stacks are, you know, will apply, and we will be showing demos. That's why it takes four more sessions uh, to go into great detail. There's no way we could cover all of this in in just one session, and so 
Um, again, uh, as we start off in January with Esri, we're going to go very much into great detail, more on the utility network and, and a hydraulically competent uh, asset registry. Uh, then we're going to go into CityWorks with all the, their work management capabilities and how it applies to the reports apply to uh, OEA uh, compliance. Um, then we um, go into, you know, Innovise, where we'll go into great detail with uh, Info Asset Planner and how we kind of do the asset performance and risk modeling with uh, deterioration curves, useful life, uh, risk scenarios, decision tree configuration. And then last but not least, we will um, go into uh, you know, the kind of the grand finale, if you will, and building how all of that information comes together in your ERP. Um, let's see. I think we have maybe a minute or so to take a look at the questions. Let's see, I do, we have one popped in. Uh, so one of the questions actually popped in is, you know, for the remaining boot camp. Uh, 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 sessions, is it required for you to already have the software and licensing to follow along? Um, absolutely not. Um, it is our goal to show you, demonstrate to you how this technology uh, can help you respond. But yeah, um, we will be showing demonstrations of the software, uh, uh, but you do not need to have the software to follow along. We'll be presenting concepts uh, that can quite honestly be deployed with the, the, the other systems that folks have answered. I have something else. Again, um, a lot of the principles are all the same. So uh, thank you for that question. Uh, but I do believe we'll be taking questions. Again, you have my email address. Uh, feel free to answer any, uh, to ask me any questions. We're, we're, we're building the data uh, so we can make the rest of the boot camp uh, very meaningful to everybody. So I think with that, Sean, uh, we've, we've come up to our time limit. Uh, any last uh, words? Yes, thank you very much, David. Highly insightful. And this does conclude part one, OEA Virtual Bootcamp. We would like to thank everyone for attending today's session. If we didn't get to a chance to answer your question today, we promise to get back to you with an answer. Part two will continue on January 15, 2020, as we discuss building a GIS-centric water asset registry and we'll focus on using the latest ESRI tools and the benefits of a hydro hydraulically competent network. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.